Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Raj Basord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London in Harley Street, based in private practice there. And I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Jerry Muller for uh, this uh, Royal College of Psychiatrists podcast. Professor Jerry Muller is the author of many books, including The Mind and the Market, Capitalism in Modern European Thought, uh, Adam Smith in His Time and Ours, and Capitalism and the Jews. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Times Literary Supplement, and Foreign Affairs, amongst other publications. He is Professor of History at the Catholic University of America. And we're talking uh, to Professor, professor Muller about his uh, recent book, uh, which has received a lot of uh, uh, press attention and been widely praised. It's called The Tyranny of Metrics. And in it, Professor Muller is arguing that this obsession with measurement and <laughs> metrics is, is widespread in society and corrosive and, generally speaking, a really bad thing. So let me start off by asking you, uh, Jerry, what is a metric? Well, it can mean uh, many different things in many contexts. Uh, and I should say at the beginning that measurement is measurement in general is often useful and frequently absolutely necessary. So the question is what kind of uh, measurement we're talking about and how it's used. I'm, I'm using metrics primarily in the sense of the attempt to replace uh, standardized judgment that's based on experience and based on talent with, uh, sorry, the, the attempt to replace uh, that kind of judgment with standardized measures uh, and then to reward and punish people on the basis of those standardized measures. That's, that's what I mean by metrics. Now, you start off the book by talking about your own personal experience and how, how you got inspired to write the book. You were you're head of a department, chair of a department, uh, an academic department at a university, and you noticed something began to happen. What was that thing that began to happen? Yes, so this is an example of of serendipity, which is the coming together of uh, chance experience with uh, longer term concerns and interests. So in this case, it had to do with my longer term concerns and interests with public policy. And in and uh, more recently, in the years after 2000, uh, there was a great deal of attention in the United States to what was called No Child Left Behind, which was federal legislation that essentially tried to institute standardized metrics for all schools and to reward and punish them accordingly. And I, I'd gone to public policy debates on this. And then when I was chair of my department some years later, I did the normal things that I thought a chair ought to do, uh, you know, cultivate faculty, hire faculty, make sure the right courses were being taught. All of that seemed to me to be worthwhile. There was a self-assessment by the department that was a useful exercise. Uh, but then I found that there were more and more requests coming from the administration for more and more information, uh, often in the form of more and more numbers. And when I asked the people in the administration, why are we doing this? What's the use of it? They said, well, it's not really that there's that much use for it, but that our credentialing agency, our accrediting agency, the Middle States Association, uh, demands these kinds of metrics. And then I started to do some research and I found out that that Middle States Association, uh, which functions under um, the auspices of the Dep Federal Department of Education, was very much influenced by policy in the Federal Department of Education, which had become increasingly oriented towards what was known as uh, accountability, uh, which meant basically measuring and rewarding and punishing uh, higher ins institutions of education accordingly. And then the more I traced it back, the more I saw it didn't start with the Department of Education or with the federal government. It was a much larger pattern in organizational culture. I didn't yet have a name for it. I, I've since uh, found the most useful term, and it's certainly not one that I created, to be managerialism. And that's what got me into it. So basically, you found that your job as head of department was being corrupted in some sense by this obsession with measurement and with you, you, you having to provide numbers. It distracted you from the central task of what you were trying to do. Yes. First of all, it distracted me. So in that sense, it was a waste of time. And secondly, I found myself, and again, I didn't have a term for this at the time. I've since discovered it's ubiquitous. I found myself engaging in gaming, 
that is finding ways to meet these requests for information uh, using a minimum of effort. Now, there are far more pernicious forms of gaming that, uh, that uh, what I call metric fixation tends to uh, lead to, but that was one of the more benign forms that I encountered in the first instance. Well, let's get, get straight into that, because there's a very interesting chapter in your book on the academic world, the university world, and the various shortcuts or gaming. So let's talk about citations, for example, because you mentioned that. So, so universities have become obsessed with the idea that you measure the quality of an academic by the journals they publish in, and this thing called an impact factor. I want you to just explain what an impact factor is, and that, uh -huh. you, should be a, that you should be a really cited academic. So what is a citation? And how do these academics get together and game the system? Well, the idea is that one that one if, is, if one is evaluating a department or one is develop, uh, evaluating a whole university, as the British system increasingly tries to do, uh, that one needs some objective evidence. So you need numbers. So you need something to count. So what are you going to count? In the first instance, you're going to count uh, as, a, as, a, as evidence of scholarly productivity. In the first instance, you're going to count uh, the number of articles. Well, it, it, for, after a while, it becomes clear that that's subject to gaming in the sense that uh, one can take one's research, including one's scientific research, and instead of publishing one important article, one can publish four or five not so important articles, and therefore one has increased the metric. So once it was realized that that metric is faulty, then the question arose what to do about it. And so the one answer was that, that was given was, well, let's look at how often uh, an article is cited by other scholars. And that in itself uh, cr creates a variety of problems. Let me just mention a few. Uh, first of all, the fact that an article is cited doesn't tell you whether it's being cited positively or negatively. Right. So if someone is citing something by Jerry Mueller and says uh, this is a brilliant contribution to our field, that's one thing. If if someone else cites it and says uh, this is an example of scholarly uh, charlatanry, uh, from the point of view of citation counts, they count as the same. Right. And so you can't tell whether something's being cited positively or negatively. Secondly, the question arises of what's the relevant medium? So in, in some fields, most of the natural sciences and some of the behavioral sciences, uh, articles are the favored uh, mode of publicizing new knowledge. But in some fields, like the field of history, it's more typically books. And so a lot of these citation indexes uh, are geared towards counting articles in journals. And then there's the question of what sort of journals you ought to count. So a lot of these scholarly citation indexes are oriented towards counting uh, articles in one particular discipline. But if someone publishes an article or, God forbid, a book that has wider resonance beyond a particular discipline, that doesn't get counted in the citation index. So those are some examples of, of how these things are easily distortive. And then in terms of how they're corrupted, uh, it, it has been known that uh, oh, journals, off, uh, journals themselves seek to have a higher number of citations because that gives them um, uh, a higher index. And so some lower journals uh, tell authors that they need to cite more articles that have appeared in that journal in order to increase the citation count of the journal. And then you have the phenomenon that I have read about. I haven't personally been part of it, of scholars forming uh, citation circles uh, to cite one another's uh, articles. And that can be done, I suppose, informally, but more often, uh, that can be done formally, but I suppose more often it can be done uh, informally. So there's all sorts of incentives to corruption. So um, this notion of the obsession with metrics is an attempt to do away with something else, which is what you might call just a judgment call using wisdom. You, the head of the department, would in the, in the old days look at various faculty members, let's say, applying for a job and use your judgment, your wisdom, your experience, your, your, your scholarship to make a decision who was good and who was bad. Mm -hmm. um, but the arrival of metrics is an attempt to be to objectively measure that, because the suspicion might be that you might um, use prejudice uh, 
or you know you might be part of an old boys club etc cetera, etc cetera. so so wasn't there a slightly noble desire to bring numbers into it yes and in some ways the uh the nobility of the motivation makes the corrupting effects um all the more uh ironic or tragic you might say uh so it's true that numbers measurement can form a counterweight to bias and prejudice and in that sense they can be genuinely useful but only if they're combined with judgment so uh you know if you see a list of um articles by a candidate for a job uh it's one thing to say oh okay this 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 person has three articles this person has five we obviously ought to interview the person with five but it depends on the judgment of the people uh reviewing the applications to know how significant are these journals to actually read some of the articles and see how important they are so that's where the question of of judgment experience talent and as you say wisdom comes in so it's it's not a matter of metrics versus judgment it, uh, optimally metrics should be used to inform judgment and judgment in turn needs to is important for deciding how significant the metrics are and also for this for uh realizing how important the things that aren't being measured are so you also at the beginning of the book talk about the fact there's a kind of philosophy attached to metrics and one of the bits of the philosophy is that if something is measurable that it's worth measuring and it's the thing you should pay attention to and yeah. you're arguing that um some things that are measurable aren't worth measuring and some things that are very difficult to measure are actually the key factor or the key variable and and yeah. that we get distracted away from important stuff just by the fact of the notion that measurability equals importance yes and i think that's the case in in almost every field uh to take a field that i don't discuss in the book but to take an obvious example uh when you're dealing with some sport let's say football or what we in the united states call soccer right you can look at the number of goals that a person is responsible for for or the number of assists that he's had with those goals but then there's the more tangible element of what role a particular player plays in terms of uh mentoring other players in terms of cooperating with them in terms of passing to them and so on those sorts of things are harder to measure and perhaps impossible to measure but they may ultimately be more important uh on the whole than that which is most easily or obviously measured and that and that holds true in a as i say in a wide variety of organizations so in a, in an academic department or in a medical department or uh or in a business uh the role of of mentoring of cooperation uh of stimulating others to their best effort uh all of those are really the difference often between a successful and an unsuccessful organization and yet they're not easily metricized and perhaps not metricizable at all i'm i'm glad you brought up the issue of sport because you make a glancing reference to this famous film moneyball uh, the brad pitt film which is a mm -hmm. counter example i would like to argue to your central argument in mm -hmm. moneyball the story as i understand it is uh, i think an economist from yale is hired in because his statistical analysis of the performance of baseball players <laughs> leads to a different analysis of who uh that the team should hire and it uh -huh. runs against the, the the kind of seat of the pants judgment that all the old scouts were using yes. and uh the moneyball example is an example of where metrics actually proved to be helpful but one of the key things that you see in the movie is the defense of metrics as an in-depth analysis by both the central proponents so they kind of understand why they're doing what they're doing Mm -hmm. um whereas what you're arguing i think in the book the blind application that simply because there's a number trumps any kind of any kind of intelligent analysis is one of the central problems with with metrics yes and it can have other problems that are unanticipated and, uh, and unintended so since publishing the book uh i've heard from a number of baseball scouts and i've often and i've also read a number of articles by people who are far more interested in baseball than i am and 
and I've written a bit about this in the in, in the uh, new preface to the soft cover edition of my book that'll be coming out in the spring. And and here's the thr- here's an interesting thing about what happened to baseball. It was discovered through this metric analysis. So so uh, probably most of your listeners are not familiar with baseball, but a lot of a lot of the interest in baseball traditionally has come from the fact that uh, batters hit. Uh, they get a single or a double or a triple and they get on the bases and then they try to steal bases and sometimes they're put out and so on. Uh, and once in a while, they hit a home run. And, and so that made that meant that there was something interesting going on most of the time in the game. It was discovered through metrics that the most effective uh, statistical means for uh, winning a baseball game, that is to say for getting the highest number of, of, uh, of runs, was, uh, that, uh, was to try to hit a home run. And that meant that you should try to hit the ball at a certain angle. It's what people in the field called a launch angle. So now all hitters are taught to hit at this launch angle. So the effect of this has been there are fewer singles, doubles, and triples. So there are fewer people running around the bases. There are a lot more strikeouts, and there are more home runs than there were in the past. But the effect, the total effect has been to make the game more boring. And so one of the striking things that's happened to American baseball is fewer and fewer people are watching it. So as it's become more metricized and objectified, it's defeated really the ultimate purpose of the sport, which is to have something interesting to watch. So one of the problems with metrics is it can divert people away from the central goal of what the whole project was in the first place. Yes. And that's a really fascinating thing that seem, that metrics seem to do because of this obsession with measurability, it moves you away from a more central question, which is almost a philosophical question, which is what are we trying to do? Right, right. And especially if you work in an organization, uh, which is true of most organizations, but especially organizations outside of the profit-making sector, you're often trying to do a number of things at the same time. So, you know, if you're, if you're teaching at a university, you're supposed to be doing some research. You're supposed to be meeting with your students. You're supposed to be conveying a certain amount of knowledge to those students, but you're also supposed to be cultivating an interest in the subject matter in those students. Uh, and sometimes you're trying to cultivate their self-confidence and so on. All of those things are important elements of what the organization is trying to do in terms of, sort of educating the whole person. Uh, but many of them aren't measurable. And if you get, uh, if you try to, uh, through organizational means, to orient people in the organization to doing one or two of those things, uh, then a then there's a couple of possibilities. Either they will they will indeed focus their attention on the things that are measured, and they will ignore or downplay the things that aren't measured and aren't rewarded, which ultimately redounds against the purposes of the organization. Or they will catch on to the fact that the things that are rewarded are not necessarily the, the key purposes of the organization and not the key purposes why they went into their profession in the first place. And in that case, it can be highly demoralizing to uh, practitioners. And this leads on to another really interesting point you make in the book, which is not in, you know, in, immediately obvious as to, as to some of the re, reper, repercussions of this kind of tyranny of metrics. And that is that it leads to a kind of conflict between the managerial class and the professional class. So managers of hospitals and managers of universities collide with professionals, i.e. the doctors or the academics, because the doctors have a professional ethos over what it is to be a doctor, and the managers are using numbers all the time and want the doctors to, to uh, treat to the number or obey the numbers. And in a way, the metricization of life um, is symbolic of or drives increasing conflict, I, I think is your argument, between the managerial class and the professional class. Could you say something about that? Sure. So some of that conflict, or at least... So conflict is is bad, but there's a certain tension there that is legitimate and inevitable. 
And that's because the practitioners, the professionals, have a certain ethos. Uh, you know, if you're a if you're a doctor, uh, you want to heal. If you're a teacher, you want to educate. If you're a social worker, you want to improve the life circumstances of your clients and so on. Uh, they have a certain ethos, and often that ethos leads them to believe that the answer to a problem is more of what they themselves do, which may indeed be the answer to a particular problem. Managers, on the other hand, uh, face the inevitable, uh, are, are tasked in some ways to face the inevitable fact of scarcity and trade-offs. So if the, if the doctor is spending uh, an hour with a patient uh, instead of 15 minutes, that means either <coughs> that the medical system is going to need far more doctors or that far fewer patients are going to get seen. And so there's a real, there's, there's a real tension there. Now, I think that these things don't necessarily have to collide if the, uh, if the managers who are using the metrics and the practitioners consult and collude with one another. I mean, collude in a positive sense. That is, if the people doing the managing are regularly consulting with the practitioners to see what sort of things they ought to be measuring and what are the trade-offs involved so that on the one hand, the, the practitioners understand why certain things are being uh, measured and the significance of them. And on the other hand, the managers understand uh, what sort of things ought to be measured and uh, perhaps why uh, particular practitioners are going outside of the normal framework in particular cases. And that leads on to a deeper problem that you mentioned in the book called, I, I think, the principal agent problem, which is often seen in relationship between the owners of companies and the people who are meant to be working at the company, like the CEO, <laughs> and the conflict between the shareholders and, and the uh, people who are working at the company. Could you say something about what is this famous principal agent problem? Yes. So this was a formulation put forward by some um, American economists first in the 1970s, and there's been much work done on it since. Uh, and the key, the key notion is that there's often a, a tension or a conflict between what are called the principles and the agents. So, and, and th those can be different sorts of people. So the principles can be, for example, the shareholders of a corporation and the, their agents, people who they've hired, are the uh, man, the hired managers of the corporation, the executives of the corporation. So then the issue arises: how do how do the, how do the principals get the agents to carry out the purposes of the principals? And, uh, and if the purposes of the principals are to maximize profitability, what's to stop the executives from say having the nicest office as possible? or uh, in some other way, uh, diverting from or diverging from the purposes of the principles. And this can occur at every level. It also occurs at the level of the executives and who may be seen as the principles and then the agents are the people below them. How do they get the people to follow the, the goals of the principles, in this case of the executives, rather than their own goals, which may be to do a minimum amount of work uh, for the maximum amount of pay? Uh, or what have you. So that's the principal agent problem in a nutshell. And the answer that's typically given in a nutshell has to do with, uh, on the one hand, uh, surveillance or what's sometimes called monitoring and reward and punishment. So the notion that you will surveil people and how will you surveil them? How will the principals keep track of what the agents want? Well, one answer that's typically given is through these standardized metrics. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the central characters, because again, your book reads like a, a thrilling novel in terms of some of the central personalities that drove the tyranny of metrics. Let's talk a bit about Robert McNamara. Um, and I, I think he's a really interesting example of how um, if you play the game of metrics, you can keep moving up in your career, despite the fact you seem to leave a trail of destruction behind you. I may be being a bit unfair, but tell me a bit about him. And it starts with the Vietnam War, and he's kind of in charge of the Vietnam War. Well, it and, actually, and, yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
and, and, and metrics play a role in, in, in his assessment um, and his portrayal of the assessment of how well America is doing in the Vietnam War. But, uh-huh. but you take up the story. Yes. So it actually starts before the Vietnam War. Uh, mm-hmm. Robert, Robert McNamara was a, uh, a whiz kid. He was, a, uh, he was the youngest tenured professor at the Harvard Business School uh in the in the years after the second world war uh and he was a pro- and it's important to note that he was a professor of accounting uh and then he uh went to work he was hired by the ford motor company in the 1950s and instituted all sorts of uh managerial metrically oriented processes there where people him he and people like him took over from what were known as car guys who were people who had typically been immersed in the making of cars for all of their life and then under uh the, in the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration he became the secretary of defense in the era of the Vietnam war where he placed also a tremendous amount of emphasis on managing through measurement uh so there so the air force for example had to give extensive reports which he looked at every day and so did johnson of the number of sorties that they flew uh against the enemy and most famously he had this metric of body counts the notion was that you would count how many people on your side had been killed and how many of the enemy had been killed. And the notion was that eventually, if the enemy's body count was a lot higher than your own, then that would lead to victory. And this led to all kinds of, uh, all kinds of distortions of information as officers provided information about body counts that was intended to uh, promote their own careers by showing how well they had done, even though actually the body counts were lower. It also had tremendous informational costs in that sometimes after a battle, soldiers were sent out to count the bodies and those soldiers in turn were shot at and sometimes killed in the process of gathering the information. And then it created, of course, perverse incentives. So there are many reasons for things like the My Lai massacre, but sometimes people were massacred in order to innocent people and as non-combatants were massacred in order to increase the body count and of course the ultimate uh, irony is that this this didn't work uh, that it didn't really um it didn't have the effect of uh destroying the will of the enemy to continue fighting and then because he because he had so much experience he then became the head of the world bank uh, and uh, that's a story in and of itself. But uh, I think the story of McNamara is important um, as an exemplification of a larger pattern of the movement of ideas uh, about how to run organizations from business schools to the private sector, to the government sector, and then to the nonprofit sector and beyond. And there's a sense of which another key character in this story, Margaret Thatcher, comes into play there uh, in terms of her ideas about you take business business ideas and, and, and use them to run the public sector. We'll come to her in a moment. Mm-hmm. But before we leave Robert McNamara, I thought there was a very interesting chapter in your book about the military. And yeah. to some extent, no, no, no disrespect from, from a foreigner to the way America fights its wars overseas. Mm-hmm. But I thought there was an interesting insight in the book as to why <laughs> you guys, despite the fact you have superior firepower over any enemy, mm-hmm. you're not doing a great job quite a lot of the time. And that's because of the metricization of war. In other words, the way the, the, the American army goes about thinking about a war in terms of numbers. So in your chapter, there's a very interesting stuff in it about counterinsurgency mm-hmm. and the way they measure how successful they are against counterinsurgents. Could you say something about that? Yes. Well, I, I don't think that the, uh, I, I think the American military has a lot of metrics as it needs to. It's the, it's, I believe it's the largest and most widely ramified organization in the world. Uh, but the question is how metrics are going to be used. So there, there's a temptation, as there always is, to try to have standardized metrics that you can use in uh, 
uh, in every situation in order to have people from the field report back to people uh, who are centrally in control at the Pentagon or uh, the Congressional Oversight Committees, for example. So, so they had this, one of the metrics that they used had to do with the number of, uh, of uh, in violent encounters that American forces were involved in. And then people who were on the ground in Afghanistan in this case uh, said, you know, these metrics are not very useful because you may have a violent encounter because the, or you may have a lack of violent encounters because you, that is the American government and its Afghan allies control a region. But you may also have a minimum of these encounters because uh, the Taliban <laughs> or the enemy controls the region. So the same metric can have the same nominal metric can have very different meanings. Now, there's a lot of smart people in the American military, and some of them came up with metrics that were better suited to the particular environment in which they were in which they find themselves. And again, fascinating enough, there's a great example in the book of, of the price of exotic fruit in Afghanistan yes. marketplaces as yes. maybe a better measure about how well the war's going. Could you tell yes. me a bit about that? Yes. So, so uh, one of the people who uh, who writes about this and who who was on the ground there uh, uh, came up with the following logic, and this is an example of how useful metrics are often based on a great deal of local and particular information. So he said, uh, if you look at the price of fruits and vegetables in the market that come from beyond the area, uh, if, uh, if, the, if the risks of bringing them into the area are very are high, then merchants are going to charge a lot for those exotic, so to speak, fruits and vegetables. If, on the other hand, the price has gone down, that's probably a good indication that there's a fair degree of safety in the area. And that that may therefore be a better measure of the actual degree of security stabilization than some other metric. But again, it's the kind of, it's the kind of metrics that's developed by practitioners based on their talent and on local knowledge. And I thought that was a very interesting example because it led me to think, and I may be completely off base here, but for example, this famous war on drugs mm -hmm. uh, that you guys are forever uh, embarked on, um, the, the measures that the people who are in favor of the war on drugs use to how successful they're waging this war are things like drug arrests and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the price of the drugs on the street seemed to me from reading your book that maybe a better you might get, get, get a better sense of how well you're doing. If, if you're doing well, then the price of drugs should go up dramatically because they should be very difficult to get hold of. But if the price is staying the same or going down, then you're not doing very well in the war against drugs. That may be a better metric. Uh, yes, it may very well be a better metric. Of course, there's also the possibility that the supply has simply become more efficient so that even though uh, measures are taken against bringing drugs into the country, uh, the pe people bringing them in may get better at it, or there may be new kinds of drugs like fentanyl, for example, that are uh, much more difficult to detect uh, by, uh, by people who are fighting the war on drugs and so on. So, but yes, on the whole, price does show you something very important about the relationship between supply and demand. So let's go back to these famous personalities. We talked about um, uh, Robert McNamara, and then we talked about this notion of bringing accounting and business thinking into other places like the army and the public sector. And another famous character in this story is, the, is Margaret Thatcher, uh, the, the famous uh, premier uh, of Britain in the 80s, who brought this view that she was going to bring business leaders in to... to um, alter the way universities were run and various other public sector institutions. Tell, tell us a bit about that story. Well, Thatcher believed, uh, rightly, I think, that substantial parts of uh, the British government, the gov British government apparatus, were uh, bloated and perhaps uh, inefficient, and being run to some degree for. Uh, 
uh, in terms of the principal agent problem, uh, being run by the agents for their own benefit. And she wanted to do something about this to see how she could make government uh, more efficient. Uh, and I, I think it was a worthy goal, and it's a goal that to some degree every public official and every elected politician ought to be thinking about all the time. The question is how to do it and what the trade-offs involved are. And so in the case of her government, uh, and then what I find so interesting in the case of subsequent British governments of both the left and the right, because the phenomenon I'm going to describe uh, continued under Blair and uh, subsequent governments, including the May government, uh, there was more and more attempt to use what they regarded as business methods, uh, essentially through greater and greater government auditing of what particular institutions were doing, and then trying to fund those institutions based uh, based on performance indicators. Uh, and that occurred in a wide variety of fields and not least in the field of higher education where there's been this huge profusion of uh, administration and bureaucracy to try to audit and evaluate uh, institutions of higher education down to the level of departments and down to the level of uh, individual researchers and to reward and punish them accordingly uh, in ways that have created all kinds of perverse effects in British academia. Now, your book um, brilliantly discusses some really fascinating concepts that are very useful to think about in life generally, and I just want to run through some of them quickly. Mm -hmm. um, um, the notion of this notion of cost disease, uh, which, again, you, you're going to be better at explaining it th than I am, but this notion that what, what leaders saw was that TV sets and technology and mobile phones are getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper. Mm -hmm. But the provision of things, services like education <coughs> and medicine and healthcare mm -hmm. don't seem to be moving in the same direction. So they believed that they could do something about that by taking one set of, of, of way, ways, ways you run the manufacture of mobile phones and transpose that into the way you run an education system. Yes. Well, the notion of, uh, of cost disease was first put forward by a couple of American economists in the 1960s, I think. Uh, and it was, a, it was more a diagnosis than a prognosis of what to do. And the, and the diagnosis, I think, was, was very profound. And that is the, the relative costs of education and medicine and some other services that were highly dependent upon human contact was going up relative to the cost of everything else because everything else was primarily made up, as you say, of, of manufactured goods. And because of developments in technology, those goods could be improved over time and be made more and more cheaply. But those kinds of uh, efficiencies were very difficult to obtain in something like education or medicine, or they famously used the case of a, of a symphony orchestra or, or of a quartet. Uh, uh, you still need four musicians for a quartet. Uh, and if an audience wants to see uh, a live concert by a quartet, which can be quite thrilling, uh, there are not very many efficiencies to be had. And so the cost disease uh, is only a disease in the sense that it raises the relative price of services like education uh, or medicine uh, or the performing arts. And therefore, people become consumers, become more sensitive to those areas. Right. So let's run through some of the other concepts that are really fascinating in the book. Um, Frederick Hayek. Yes. Um, who was he and this idea of scientism, which is fascinating, mm -hmm. the problem of scientism. Could you say something about that? <laughs> yes. So Hayek was uh, a social and political and economic theorist. He came out of uh, Austria, he was born in 1899 and after a career uh, in the United Kingdom and then in the United States. Uh, he passed away in, in 1992. Uh, he got interested in 
what he came to call the question of scientism uh, that arose originally out of his critique of socialist planning and why he thought it wouldn't work. Uh, and that led him to a deeper inquiry into uh, this larger cultural pattern that he called scientism, which essentially is, well, there's a couple of versions of it. One is the belief that the methods that are appropriate to the natural sciences can readily be applied to human affairs. Or another version of it is that the only real knowledge is knowledge that can be expressed in precise mathematical terms. Or, and this was the part that in interested Hayek the most, that economic affairs were matters of engineering, as, as if economic planners were in a position to know and control all the relevant inputs and outputs. And that led him, uh, as it did uh, some other theorists like uh, Michael Oakeshott and Michael Polanyi, into a, a critique of the notion that there's uh, only one kind of knowledge and that that's scientific knowledge. And the, the thrust of the critique is that there are other kinds of knowledge. There's a kind of knowledge that's sometimes called practical knowledge or tacit knowledge that is based on that is usually based on experience and that can't be simply taught or translated into formulas. And that's basically the notion of scientism. And, and why is that relevant uh, to metricization or, or the tyranny of metrics? Because there's, there's a link between the notion that you can control things, because if you know all the numbers, mm -hmm. through central planning. I think Hayek was a great critic of central planning and saying that really, actually making a, a, a million different people making a decision in the marketplace, the market will come up with a better sense of what is the correct decision than one central planner, despite the fact the central planner having scientifically more information in terms of measurement available to them. Yes. So his argument was that the market works better, not because there's this abstract thing called the market, because as you say, there are millions of individuals who have their own sources of knowledge, uh, knowledge of what people want, uh, knowledge of a local shortage or a local surplus. Uh, and that kind of uh, local knowledge, which in a market individuals have an incentive to use because of the profit motive, uh, that kind of local knowledge is something that the, uh, or you might also call it as high, the diffused knowledge. That's a kind of knowledge that a central planner can't have. And there are some respects in which, uh, in which managerialism, insofar as it's focused on metrics, is an attempt uh, within business organizations and non-business organizations to, uh, to, to engage in this kind of pseudo-scientific control by thinking that the numbers, uh, the metrics can supply you with, can supply the, the managers or the executives with all the relevant information that they need in order to conduct the purposes of the organization. Okay, and um, we're running out of time a little bit, but there's so much to talk about. I just want to pick up on a couple of other interesting, th interesting things in the book. Again, there's some cracking um, terms, Campbell's Law and Goodhart's Law. Could you tell us what those laws are and who those people were? Yes. So they are essentially uh, versions of the same idea uh, that were put forward by Campbell, who was... Uh, an American social psychologist, uh, and uh, and a similar idea was put forward at the same time by Goodhart, who was uh, a British economist. So the the Campbell version is the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures, and the more it will distort the processes that it was intended to measure. So in Goodhart had a more terse formulation, any measure used for control is unreliable. Or to put it another way, anything that's measured and rewarded will be gamed. And th those are essentially versions of the same idea. So that by trying to measure some, if you measure something with the intention of controlling it and rewarding and punishing people uh, for the measures that they get, that in itself will create incentives for gaming and will distort the process itself for reasons that we've 
described, that people will focus their attention on uh, maximizing the metrics at the expense of the larger purposes of the organization. So one example, and there's an excellent chapter in your book on, on medicine, is a surgeon may be rewarded um, uh, for the outcome of their operations, and, and, and all that happens then is they just decide to operate on less risky cases. And as a result, uh, risky patients suffer. They may not get operated on at all and may die, and as a result, never turn up in, in some surgeon's um, tabulation of statistics. So it's an example of where if you try to use numbers to reward people, uh, the system will get gamed. Yes. So it cre and this is true in a wide variety of fields. So certainly in surgery, as you say, where it creates this propensity to uh, risk aversion uh, or to what's sometimes called creaming. That is, you only deal with the cases that are most easily solved and you avoid more difficult cases. Uh, it can also happen in a wide variety of other fields. So in college education, for example, uh, one of the ways in which, uh, probably the easiest way in which you can improve the educational outcomes is by admitting better students in the first place. <laughs> uh, and uh, under No Child Left Behind, when, as I mentioned earlier, uh, schools were rewarded and punished based on the performance of their students, uh, in many cases, schools would try to have weak students uh, classified as uh, in some one way or another, mentally deficient, so that they wouldn't uh, take so that they wouldn't take the test in the first place, and hence wouldn't be counted in the metrics. So this this process of um, uh, of the way in which uh, metric fixation can can lead to uh, risk aversion and creaming is uh, ubiquitous. Now you come up with a very surprising analysis, in my opinion, as to where this tyranny of the metrics came from. You come up with several different theories, but one interesting theory is the notion of the rise of the meritocracy and um, this notion of low social trust. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to be arguing that in a, in a previous era when an aristocracy or, or people kind of inherited leadership and were very confident, therefore, because they were a leadership class mm -hmm. uh, about what they were doing, maybe misplaced confidence, but confidence nonetheless, mm -hmm. they didn't need to rely on numbers. And that something about the meritocracy and the rise of a new group of leaders who are less confident, <laughs> that, that they, they, they turn naturally to numbers to reassure themselves that they know what they're doing. Yes, I think that, yes, I think that's the case. And again, uh, the fact that in a more sort of caste-based society where there's some uh, ruling group that has a great deal of self-confidence and familiarity with one another, uh, they see less need for external or outside or objective evidence to make decisions. Now, as you rightly say, and as I say in the book, it doesn't mean that their decisions are always right. They may very well have been wrong, but they didn't feel compelled to find these objective sources of evidence. When you have people who, uh, if you have a low trust society, and not all societies are low trust, uh, uh, I'm speaking next week in, in Oslo and in the Scandinavian societies, they're generally regarded as more high trust societies. But when you have more low trust societies, that is to say where people are more suspicious of institutions and of the people who work in and manage those institutions, there's more of a institutional and psychic incentive to try to prove one's worth through numbers. So finally, and by, by, by the way, I just want to say the, the ironic thing is that um, is that metrics are used as a replacement for trust. But ironically, uh, a, a system of metrics fixation can diminish trust as well, since after all, the principals are constantly telling the agents that they don't trust them. Yeah. Okay. So finally, you, you right at the end of the book, you give a very good guide as to when metrics are a good idea, mm -hmm. what is a good metric, and when metrics are a really bad idea. So there's a sense in which what people should do is when they hear a number, like an arrest rate or a, mm -hmm. or, or any kind of number the government wheels out or a school league table, um, they should think a little bit more carefully about the number. And you give a guide as to how to think about these numbers to, to figure out whether it's a good number or a good measure you should pay attention to or a bad number or bad measure. Could you just run through a little bit some of that guide? Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit is to think about um, to think about what the 
well, to think about what the, what the relationship is between what's been measured and what's really important in an institution. Uh, secondly, to think about what ideological factors are there behind a particular measurement. In other words, is it really the most important thing or is it the thing that you as a client or consumer or customer or, or citizen are most interested in or is there some kind of uh, ideological spin behind it. And then ask yourself to what degree the system for coming up with this metric has been created in such a way that it creates all sorts of incentives for gaming in ways that may make the metrics quite unreliable or even distortive. That's from a point of view of consuming numbers. Um, if you're uh, somebody who's interested in developing metrics, then there's a series of suggestions that I make as well, and people can read them. But one of them certainly has to do with the importance of the people who are uh, developing the metrics, consulting with the practitioners while the metrics are being created, and then from time to time thereafter, again, to see which things are really measurable what things are most important, what things are being left out, what things are gameable. And that's something that people creating metrics should try to be conscious of as well. So uh, a lot of it has, a, a lot of the creation of useful measurement and useful metrics has to do with making use of the uh, tacit experience-based knowledge of practitioners in formulating the metric measures in the first place. Well, it's uh, it's been wonderful talking to you, uh, Professor Muller. The title of the book, The Tyranny of Metrics, uh, by Jerry Muller, uh, published by Princeton University Press. I'm going to finish with just one final question, an unfair question, perhaps, which is probably going to lead you to run screaming from the room. But given your expertise now in in the notion that metrics should be thought through a bit more carefully, could you give us a, a personal example of having written the book or in researching the book where you personally have made a decision in your life whereby you kind of ignored the metrics? In other words, that the numbers would have pushed you in one direction and you decided to go in another because you were suspicious of what the numbers meant. Probably an unfair question, but I just well, wondered if the... Well, in thinking about medical in, medical institutions, uh, what doctor one goes to, what practice one goes to, what mm -hmm. hospital one goes to, uh, I simply become a lot more aware of how easily distorted those metrics are. So, for example, if you're if you're looking online at the degree of uh, patient satisfaction with a doctor. Mm -hmm. Uh, it often turns out that there's really no relationship between patient satisfaction with a doctor or with a hospital and mm -hmm. the actual uh, and patient outcomes in terms of, you know, how well operations go and so on. So the things that patients might be most concerned about, how they're treated by the office staff and so on, may not be uh, indicative of how good the physician uh, actually is. So I'm, I'm, uh, and also, uh, as I'm so aware of how much these things are gamed, you know, when I look at uh, metric evaluations on Amazon or something like that, it becomes clear to me that there are cases in which the authors have gone to great lengths to uh, create their own uh, positive metric evaluations under a variety of uh, uh, of names and gaming methods and so on. So I, in general, I I think twice and thrice uh, before accepting the validity of any metric. Well, Jerry Muller, I'm going to give your book five stars, despite <laughs> your suspicion over metrics. And uh, thank you very much indeed for, for uh, talking to us about your wonderful book. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure.